well, it's only my second week doing this, and I've already misled you. Uh, I've given some false advertising because I'm not going to be preaching everything that Davis just read. Despite what it says in your bulletin, it says that the sermon text is Mark 1, verses 9 to 13, and you may think, well, that's short enough, five verses. What does he mean he's not preaching all of that? Well, I'm not. I realized this week as I studied this passage that it is just way too rich. There's just too much there um, for me to do justice to both of these scenes. And so we're going to break this into kind of a part one and part two. So this week is going to be verses 9 to 11, and next week is going to be verses 12 and 13. Apologies to Jewel, who does runs our social media channels and created a beautiful graphic which featured the words that I'm not preaching this morning. But that way, but, but at least you'll, where are you? At least you're not going to have to create a new one this week. You can just reuse it. Um, all right. So, Mark 1, 9 to 11. You can go ahead and turn there. And I neglected to mention during the announcements that we have Bibles. And um, in fact, now I'm remembering in my announcements, I said that two things will serve you in this service, and I only mentioned one. I mentioned the service guide, but the other thing that you're really going to need in order to uh, follow along is a Bible. And we have them available in the back. You're welcome to, you don't need to be embarrassed. Just stand up and slip back there and grab one and don't ever give it back. That is our gift to you. Take it and use it. Well, before we, we dive into the passage, I mentioned that at the beginning of, of these first few messages, I would help to tr try to set the stage or the context of this Gospel of Mark so that we could have a bit of an aerial view, an, 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 over, an understanding of what Mark is up to in, this, in writing this Gospel. And one of the things off the bat that we are confronted with today is that Mark begins with his main character at the age of 30. Now, what kind of biography are you aware of that's you know, any good where it just begins abruptly at the age of 30 and only covers three years of the person's life? Well, that's what Mark is doing. And there are reasons for that. In fact, we're gonna, we're gonna discover some of those reasons as we continue through the Gospel of Mark. But I just want you to notice that unlike some of the other Gospel writers, for example, Matthew and Luke, Mark doesn't give us anything about Jesus' birth. It doesn't put you in the Christmas spirit. There's nothing about Jesus at the temple at the age of 12, nothing about his upbringing. We don't have to wait for the plot to thicken in the gospel according to Mark. Mark thrusts us. He wastes no time thrusting us immediately into the ministry of Jesus. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the inaugural event in the public ministry of this man, the most significant person ever to walk the earth. Davis read the passage. There are two points that I think arise out of those first three verses. Anointed by the Spirit and approved by the Father. That's what we're going to think about together this morning. Anointed by the Spirit, we, we see that in verses 9 and 10, and Jesus is approved by the Father. We'll see that in verse 11. So, so first of all, anointed by the Spirit. Look there at verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Okay, that is a lot of proper nouns. <laughs> Not only do you have Jesus and John, but you got Nazareth, Galilee, Jordan. But the important thing to see is that Jesus is not like the people we read about last week coming to John from Jerusalem. Jesus is coming from his hometown in the northern region of Galilee. In fact, Nazareth is so obscure that it is mentioned a grand total of zero times in your Old Testament. I mean, think about this. Most of the folks, as I said, were coming to John from where? From Jerusalem, the capital city of God's people, from the, the halls of power, the, the hub of religious happening and influence. And then suddenly, here comes the long-awaited king from where? This, this little backwater we've never heard of? I mean, this does not scream royalty. And yet Mark includes this detail. 
And we know Mark doesn't include needless details. He's in a rush to get to the point, but he includes this detail that Jesus came from Nazareth so that it would not be lost on us. That the Messiah the people needed was not the one they were expecting. And it wasn't just Nazareth that was obscure. Remember, John was baptizing in the middle of nowhere too. He was far from the halls of power in the bright lights of influence. We don't even know what section of the Jordan River he was baptizing in. I've been to the traditional site of it, but we don't really know. It was just a remote place in the Judean wilderness, far from the hub of religious happening. And yet this event in this remote place has cosmic significance. 2,000 years later on another continent, we are talking about it. Friends, don't assume that any place or any person, including you, is too obscure, too uninfluential, too small, too weak for God to use to do something big. This scene is also unexpected because of what we saw last week. Remember verse 1? Mark wants us to realize that Jesus is no ordinary guy. That, that banner flying over the whole book. He is the Messiah, the Son of God. And then remember, after that banner in verse 1, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, verses 7 and 8, where John the Baptist echoes Mark's view of Jesus, his high view of Jesus. And John the Baptist says, yeah, I'm underqualified to even fall down and untie the guy's sandals. And yet here, those very sandals stroll into the scene because the king has come and he wants a baptism of repentance. I mean, we know from the other gospels that John himself was scandalized by this. He was like, whoa, 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 no, no, this is backwards. I should be the one getting baptized by you. By the way, I, I challenged last week, I, I, I mentioned that if you're here as a skeptic, it, it, you, you don't trust the historical reli reliability of the Bible. I said, I'm so thrilled you're here, and I'd love to chat with you. And I, I, I pointed out the fact that, and I challenge you to consider that the Gospel of Mark is, was written too early, too close to the events described in order for legends to have had time to develop. Well, there's something else I want to submit to your consideration this morning, and that's that this story of Jesus getting baptized is not something any of the earliest Christians would have made up. It's actually inconvenient. It's embarrassing. It's something that requires explanation because John's baptism, as we saw last week, was for whom? Sinners. It was a baptism not of just religious consecration, but a baptism of repentance. And here you have the one whom Christians worship as perfect, the sinless son of God, submitting to a ritual that is solely for sinners. The earliest Christians would have never invented this story. The only reason it makes sense to include as if it actually happened. So why did Jesus have to be baptized? It, it's a good question. And Mark doesn't give us a bullet-pointed answer. He's not writing an encyclopedia or even a systematic theology textbook. Remember, he's breaking news. He's just reporting, recounting what happened in history, which leaves us to put together some of the pieces, to, to figure out why. Why does the sinless Son of God undergo a baptism of repentance. And before you freak out at what I'm about to tell you, they're going to be brief, but I'm going to give you seven reasons. <laughs> and you, here's the thing, you can probably think of more, but I'm going to give you seven brief reasons why Jesus was baptized. One, he was baptized to validate John's ministry. To validate John's ministry. This man may look eccentric, 
but he hasn't gone spiritually rogue. His mission is from God, and I associate myself with him. Number two, Jesus was baptized, surely in part, to set an example for God's people, most immediately for the Israelites of the day, but, but even by extension for us. Despite the important differences, which we looked at last week, between John's baptism and Christian baptism, Trinitarian baptism, Jesus is still modeling, I think, the importance of this ritual of being plunged underwater as a symbol of repentance. Speaking of which, number three, and here's where the reasons get a little more interesting. Jesus was baptized to identify with sinners. To identify with sinners. Hear me carefully. Even though he was not a sinner, he was baptized to identify with those who are. Those whose judgment he came to bear. And even the symbol itself, the symbol itself is a little clue, isn't it? It's a little preview of the way he's going to do that, of the way he's going to deal with the sin problem and bear the judgment of those who deserve God's curse by dying and being raised again to life. So he was baptized to validate John's ministry, to set an example for God's people, to identify with sinners. Number four, Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, to fulfill all righteousness. Those are his own words in Matthew's gospel. Now, I'm doing my best to let Mark, in all of his breathless brevity, speak for himself. And so I'm actually exercising a lot of self-control, you're welcome, by not bringing in all these other details from Matthew and Luke and John to give us a fuller picture of what occurred at his baptism. And yet, I am mentioning this one because Jesus, in Matthew chapter 3, gives us an explicit reason for his baptism. When he says, quote, it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Have you ever wondered why Jesus couldn't have just died for sin earlier in his life? Like, why couldn't Jesus have just died as a child, a perfect child, and that be satisfactory to God? Why did he have to live all the way into adulthood, to live more than three decades of life and difficulty and opposition and even torture and death. Why did it get so drawn out? Well, it's because we learn in Galatians 4, 4, at the fullness of time, at just the right time, God sent his son, a Jew, who was, quote, born under the law. Born under the law. And in order to become qualified to save the world, he had to first trust every word from God's mouth, obey every dimension of God's law, and meet every requirement for God's people. It wasn't enough for Jesus to just do nothing to offend God. Four-year-old Jesus, eight-year-old Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus had done nothing to offend God. Jesus also had to do everything to please God, which meant keeping the law. And this baptism was one vital step in a marathon of active obedience to the Father. Numbers 5, 6, and 7, we'll think about more as the sermon progresses, but I'll just tick them off to you now. Jesus was baptized to launch his public ministry. Jesus was baptized to reveal the Trinity. And he was baptized to showcase God's approval. Launches public ministry, reveal the Trinity, and to showcase God's approval. We'll think about these more in a, in a moment. Look at verse 10. 
Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. The reason we read, the reason Jewel stood up here and read uh, 1 Samuel 16 earlier, the, the account of Samuel anointing David, the little shepherd boy, the unexpected son of Jesse to be king. The reason we read that is because that is part of the rich precedent that forms the backdrop to what's going on here in Mark chapter 1. Because what's going on is Jesus is being anointed. This is a kind of subtle coronation ceremony. At the outset of his service, at the outset of his public ministry, the man from Nazareth is being consecrated and anointed and empowered by the Spirit of God for the task he's been given. It's not entirely clear why Jesus takes the form of a dove. Ancient Jewish tradition associated uh, the, the dove with what we read in the very second sentence of your Bible, Genesis 1-2, uh, where the Spirit of God was brooding or hovering over the face of the waters. In fact, the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament translates Genesis 1-2 as the Spirit of God fluttered over the face of the waters. And of course, after the flood, Genesis chapter 8, it's a dove that carries the news to Noah and to everyone inside the ark of the, uh, the, the news of the receding waters. And so I think that the spirit here in Mark 1 comes as a dove to signal that this is also a new beginning. This man is no ordinary man. He is going to inaugurate a brand new creation and to equip him for that task, he's going to be empowered by the life-giving spirit of God. If you're not yet a believer in Jesus, I want you to notice the way God descends. When God the Son, Christians believe, Christians confess, when, when God the Son descended, he came as what? A baby. Meek, gentle. When God the Spirit descends here, how does he come? As a dove, meek, gentle. And this is fitting because God is not just a cosmic drill sergeant. He's not a deadbeat dad in the sky. He, he's not just, he's not any of these things that, that we project onto him. He is holy. And yet, amazingly, he's also gentle. Far more gentle than any of you are. Far more gentle than I am. Jesus, the Bible tells us, is, uh, uh, God, the Bible tells us, is patient and kind in that he's actually slow, not quick, slow to become angry. But friend, do not, we beg you, do not mistake his patience with you, his patience with sinners for indifference towards sin. Because he's actually going to descend again. And it's not going to be as a baby in a manger or a dove on a shoulder. It's going to be as a mighty, glorious, conquering king who will come and put the world to rights. But he will also come to righteously judge those who have stubbornly and pridefully refused to stop living for themselves to stop living for the things of the world, to re who have refused to turn around and to, and to turn away from their sin and to put their trust in Jesus and to live for him. Listen, there is nothing that we would love to talk with you more about. If you're here today and you're not yet a believer in this Jesus, there's nothing more we'd love to talk with you about than that. I'll be standing at the door at the back of the service. Any member of this church would be glad to have that conversation with you. We welcome your questions here at RCBC. If verse 10 shows that Jesus, as, we, as we've just seen, is spirit anointed, verse 11 shows us that he is father approved. 
Verse 10, spirit anointed. Verse 11, father approved. And that's the second point, approved by the father. Remember verse 1? Mark identifies Jesus as God's son. Verse 11, God agrees with him. Or rather, Mark's agreeing with God. But verse, verse 11, the voice of the father is echoing the assertion of Mark that, yes, this is the son of God. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is actually the first of only three times in all the gospels, all four of them, that God the father speaks audibly. The other two are at the transfiguration of Jesus and right before he goes to the cross. Verse 11 here is, is worth lingering over because it's a prime example of the value of knowing your Old Testament in order to understand the new. There are 260 chapters in your New Testament. 260 chapters. 248 of which, all but 12, reference the Old Testament in some way. Whether through a direct quote or an echo or an illusion. And this matters because we come to passages like this and we read Mark 1, 11, and we see, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And we think, oh, isn't that sweet? It's a kind of heavenly Hallmark card to Jesus from dad. <laughs> of course, we miss how pregnant each phrase is with ancient biblical significance. You know, when you're reading something online, uh, you see various words or phrases which are underlined because they're clickable. It's called hyperlinks, all right? And you can, you can double click on a word or phrase and it'll open up a new window and, and take you to something else entirely where you can do a deeper dive. I want you, as your main preaching pastor at RCBC, to see over and over again that your New Testament is hyperlinked, thoroughly hyperlinked. And it, it doesn't have to be a direct quote. There can just be a link there that you double click on and go to see the background, the backdrop of the Old Testament. So we're going to do this little exercise here, okay? We're going to click on a couple phrases. First of all, let's double click on the phrase, you are my son, and see where it takes us. You are my son. All right. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 2. And you don't even need to leave your finger in Mark because we're going to look at a few places, okay? So stretch out, get ready. We're going to look at a few places in the Old Testament before we return to Mark. Psalm chapter 2. This is a, a coronation psalm that was read when an, old, when, a, when an Israelite king took the throne. Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. God says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And then the king speaks, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. That's what Mark is echoing. These words spoken from God to the king in the Old Testament, you are my son. Now, we could just return to Mark chapter 1 so that we could speed ahead to the benediction and you could go to lunch, but I am going to show you some more. And I'm not even going to apologize for it because it's not just Psalm 2. Psalm 2, this, this statement, you are my son, doesn't just sort of arise out of nowhere. Oh, isn't that neat? No. I want to back even farther up, uh, further, further back, because Psalm 2 is actually not the beginning, but the continuation of one of the Bible's greatest themes. In the Garden of Eden, Adam was created and installed as a son of God. 
And he functioned as a king, ruling the world on God's behalf. And along with his wife, the queen Eve, they failed in this task to rule the world for God. They failed and everything became fractured. When they turned their back on God and chose to follow their own hearts, to follow their own way, everything became fractured from top to bottom. Their relationship with God started to unravel and their relationship with one another and with the created world unraveled as well. Now, fast forward from the Garden of Eden, failed king and queen, Adam, this original son of God. Fast forward to Exodus chapter 4. Now, turn there with me. Turn to Exodus 4. This is the second book in the Bible. And I want you to see how God instructs Moses and how he describes Israel. Exodus 4, look there in verse 22. Moses, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. So Moses is going to Pharaoh to basically say, let my people go, right? And, and God says, say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn, what? Son. And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. But you refused Pharaoh to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. So Adam is a son of God, and he fails. Israel is a son of God, and we know they fail. Now turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. This is a load-bearing chapter. 2 Samuel 7. God is making a promise to King David and look at the middle of verse 11, 2 Samuel 7, 11, in the middle. The Lord declares to you, David, that the Lord himself will establish a house. And he doesn't just mean a temple, he means a dynasty. The Lord will establish a dynasty for you. Verse 12, when your days are over, David, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. It's not talking about Jesus. Actually, this, in the most immediate context, is talking about Solomon. But then look at verse 13. He is the one who will build a house that is a temple for my name, which Solomon went on to do. But then... He says, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for several decades. No. Forever. This is not anymore just talking about Solomon because that is an eternal promise. God is saying, David, there will be a king from your line who sits on the throne forever. And in the meantime, this is how God will interact with every Israelite king. Verse 14, I will be his father and he will be my son, which is why Psalm 2 says what it does. It's why in Psalm 2, those words of coronation that thunder from heaven to the king of Israel are, you are my son. So once again, lest you miss what I'm doing here, Adam was a son of God who blew his calling and dropped that royal mantle. Israel was a son of God who blew its royal calling and dropped that royal mantle. David was a son of God as as king of Israel who blew his royal calling and dropped that royal mantle. And every king after him blew it and dropped it. And by the end of the Old Testament, it's lying shattered in a thousand pieces. And so in Mark 1, you can turn back there. When we come to this scene in the Judean wilderness after centuries of of failure, disobedience, exile, 400 years of silent treatment from heaven, it is no mere hallmark card for God to speak words of approval over one particular man in David's line. This means that he's not given up on his ancient promises. The man is here. At last, God is saying, this is the son. 
This is the one all the others pointed to. This is the one I have loved for all eternity because he's not merely an Israelite king. He is my eternal beloved son. And this means that Jesus is on the scene to pick up that shattered royal mantle, that forfeited calling, that failed vocation of Adam and Israel and David and all the kings after. And he picks it up and he marches on without fumbling. But he doesn't do so as the conquering military hero that all the people expected. He does so in a way no one expected. And that's as a suffering servant which is the other phrase we need to double-click on. Look at the other phrase Mark uses. This is my son whom I love. That is, that is Psalm 2. With whom I am well pleased. Those words are hyperlinked also. So turn with me, and we'll only go to one place this time. Turn with me to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 this is the first of Isaiah's servant songs, the prophet's songs about a coming servant. And God says in Isaiah 42, verse 1, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. There it is. That's what God's voice in Mark 1 is echoing. Here's my servant whom I love, whom I delight in. And just in case we don't think the connection's strong enough, look what else is there. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. And this same individual, Isaiah chapter 53, will tell us, is going to suffer and die in the place of his people for their many, many, many sins. In other words, this Messiah is not just going to be a mighty king, Psalm 2 but also a suffering servant, Isaiah. So do you hear the echoes, the resonances between these passages and ours? Psalm 2, you, O king, are my son. Isaiah 42, you are my servant in whom I delight. With you I'm well pleased. And then the spirit descends on this servant, Mark 1. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And then the spirit descends on him like a dove. Now, I'm not going to apologize for what I just did and, and act like, well, that was really theological. That seemed like a lecture. I need to get practical now because theology is practical. And you actually needed everything I just said in order to learn to read your Bible better. If I'm doing this expositional preaching thing right, then one of the benefits of it will be that it serves you Monday to Saturday, as you're alone in God's word, because you will know how to better read it in light of the whole. So what I just did wasn't impractical. And yet, what we just considered is bristling with practical implications, even more so. I mean, just, just think about this for a second. The job of the king and this is the same with presidents today. We, we understand this intuitively, even CEOs and um, heads of boards and, and all the rest. It, the, the job of a king was to, be a, uh, to represent the whole people, to be a stand-in for the people. If it went well for the king, it went well for the people. If it went poorly for the king, it went poorly for the people. And if you are united to King Jesus by faith, which is how you get united to him. If you're united to King Jesus, then this means that he represents you. He stands for you before the eyes of a holy God. In other words, when God sees you, he's looking at you through his sinless, spotless son. The same spirit that rested on Jesus at his baptism resides inside of you if you belong to him. 
And the same father that takes great delight in his son takes great delight in you if you belong to Christ. He, he looks at you and, and, and sees you through his spotless son and says, this is my child. You are my child whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Not with you, I'm moderately pleased. Not with you, I was well pleased in that one season of your life. Remember in college how serious you were? No, it, it, it's just full-throated with you, I am well pleased. If you belong to Jesus, if you are trusting in Jesus, if you are hidden in Jesus, then the Father adores you. Do not project your misconceptions about God onto him based on whatever your experience with authority figures in your life has been. God is not like the worst dads, and he's not even like the best dads. He's far better. The God of the universe sees you and cherishes you. And once you internalize this, that he doesn't just merely tolerate you, he doesn't regret saving you, he's not like, well, I won't make that mistake again. He loves you. He's pleased with you today. Then this will revolutionize everything in your daily life. Because his attitude, his disposition is the same toward you as it is toward Jesus. Which means you cannot, if you belong to Jesus, it is impossible for you to be a constant disappointment to him. It's not that he loves you because you were so lovely. It's that you are becoming lovely because he loved you. And this should put everything into perspective this coming week. Now, that's great, right? That's great that everything, if, you, if you're united to Christ, everything that is true of Jesus becomes true of you. But that's a very individual application. And there's nothing wrong with individual applications, but a lot of churches and preachers only apply God's word in that gear. And I want to be a church. I'm not saying I've mastered this. I'm saying you can pray for me that I would do this well. I want to be a church that engages also in congregational application, horizontally. And there is a clear one here. Because it's just not about how God sees you. It's also about, therefore, how do you see others? When you look at another Christian, especially one of your brothers and sisters here at RCBC, do you first see, wow, that person is a piece of work? Or do you look at them and say, I love them. I, I'm well pleased with him. And do you first see a sinner, or to use the language of the Bible, do you first see a saint? Listen, the, the Bible is littered with sinners. Just read. I mean, there were, there were a lot of crazy churches in the New Testament, and yet none of the letters start with, to the sinners in Thessalonica, to the sinners in Ephesus. No, it's always to the saints, because that is our dominant identity if we belong to Christ, to the saints in Richmond, to the saints at River City Baptist. To the degree that you understand how God views people who are in Christ, you will start to view them similarly. And to the degree you forget it, you will start to treat them the way that in your selfishness you help, hope God never treats you. So let's meditate afresh on God's personal and particular and passionate love for us and let that spill over into the way we view and treat others. Before we conclude, it's, it's worth recognizing that this is one of Scripture's first clear glimpses of something that is present in the Old Testament, but hidden mostly. And that is what we talked about earlier in the service, the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I, I'm not going to give a, um, a, a big lecture on this. I'm just going to suffice it to say that the Christian doctrine of the Trinity 
distinguishes Christianity from every other major philosophy, religion, and worldview. Atheists believe in no God. Polytheists like uh, uh, Hindus and Buddhists believe in many gods. There are monotheistic religions. Uh, Christianity is one of them. Also our Jewish friends and our Muslim friends, they believe in one God, and yet that God is, to, to use kind of a technical word, unipersonal. In, in, in other words, there, he is not a community of persons the way that the Trinity is. The Trinity uniquely is the doctrine from Scripture that says that God has always existed as a loving union of three. Not his oneness at the expense of his threeness, not his threeness at the expense of his oneness, but an eternal triangle of love and joy. And by the way, don't use metaphors to explain it because they're all heretical, okay? The Trinity is not like an egg. It's not like gas and water and ice. It's not like any of those things. The Trinity is beyond our comprehension. And yet what's important to understand is that if God has really existed forever in a community of persons, then that means that love is eternal and is at the heart of all reality. Think about it. According to Islam, love cannot be eternal because God was a solitary, uni unipersonal being for, for, for all of eternity, and he never had anyone to love. Love could have only began when he created the first being to love. So that means power might be eternal. Power might be at the heart of reality, but love is not. But Christianity says, no, 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 no. Power and love have always existed in the person of God because he has been loving Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this beautiful harmony of joy forever. We've already seen how Mark alludes to Isaiah 42. And this is my conclusion. It says that right here. So let's hope, let's hope I uh, don't off-road. Conclusion. We've already seen how, how Mark alludes to uh, Isaiah 42 and how that's important. But you know there's another place where the prophet Isaiah prays, O oh Lord, Isaiah 64.1. Oh, that you would rend or tear the heavens and come down. That was the longing of the prophets of old. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. And that prayer is answered 700 years later in our story as the heavens are torn open and the spirit descends. And this signals that a new age is dawning. The, the new age that Isaiah was proclaiming and longing for is here in seed form. But you know, this verb in Mark 1 for the heavens being torn open, schizo, you can hear the word schism, the, the heavens being torn open. You know, it doesn't just point backward to Isaiah. It also points forward because this verb appears two times in the Gospel of Mark. Here and in chapter 15, verse 38. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was schizoed. It was torn into from top to bottom. And when the Roman centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, and this also is an echo of Mark 1, surely this man was the son of God. At the beginning of the book, God tears the heavens to send his presence. And at the end of the book of Mark, God tears the temple curtain to signal that the need for animal sacrifices is over because the final sacrifice has been offered and now Anyone can enter into the presence of a holy God through trusting in the Messiah. At the beginning of the book, God tore the heavens and said, 
This is my son. And at the end of the book, God tears the curtain. And the very next words we hear are from someone who had a hand in murdering the Messiah. Surely this man was the son of God. And if that's what you believe as well, you too, just like that Gentile Roman centurion, you too have access to the presence of a holy God who looks at you, not as your judge, but as your father. And he is deeply delighted by what he sees. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you that at your baptism, you identified with sinners, and at the cross, you died for them. And Lord, we praise you that you have come on the scene here in Mark 1, not just to act and to speak for God, but to act and speak as God, because it is God that we need to enter our lives. Give us faith and give us hope and bring us safely home. And it's in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.